Hi, everyone. My name is Roy Dong. I'm a research assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And today I'm going to be talking about some recent works and problems we've been considering lately related to how consumers can make decisions in the age of surveillance capitalism. So the problem of learning under surveillance. How do you decide when and how to collect data when there's an observer who is watching you do this and is using that information for their own purposes? Um, so this is a joint work with Eric Mailing, who is a postdoc who's on the job market right now, and Cedric Langbor, another faculty member at Illinois. So, oh, sorry, one sec. Um, so I'm going to make this slide pretty quick because I think I'm quite likely preaching to the choir, but the main takeaway is that we're in this age of surveillance capitalism. Our personal data is commodified. Um, the purchase, sale, and analysis of you know, our personal data is just an industry worth hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And, you know, we, most of the time when we use these free online services like Gmail, we are not the customer, we are the product. And I would say this is one of the sort of fundamental anxieties of our time. Like people, you know, in and outside of tech feel this sort of anxiety. And so from the consumer side, it's called uh, surveillance capitalism, but I also kind of want to take a moment and talk about it from the business side. Um, so... There's an analogous anxiety for, you know, the operations of large businesses. And, you know, the term I hear there a lot of the times is digital transformation, which refers to just the way data is going to transform industries. It's creating a business ecosystem where you need to use data uh, to survive. Uh, it's an ecosystem where the competitive advantage that data gets you becomes so essential that you cannot survive without it. So on the other hand, this like personalized and targeted uh, data analytics is kind of a necessary thing uh, as we continue to exist in sort of these competitive economies. So just kind of want to highlight both the consumer side and the business side. And so for the purposes of this talk, when I talk about like surveillance capitalism and really the digital, tra digital transformation, all these things, I'm really just going to focus on personalized pricing algorithms uh, in this talk. And before I get started, I want to temper everyone's sort of expectations about what this talk is. I think what I'm presenting right now is what I would consider sort of early preliminary results and what I would consider a multi-year endeavor. So there's going to be some strong modeling assumptions and things that we hope to relax in the future. Um, I'll outline some of the shortcomings of this model and sort of come back to it a little bit at the end and discuss sort of some of the future directions we're looking at. But really, these are preliminary results. And I'm really hoping that some of these ideas will provoke some sort of fruitful and interesting conversations and maybe the considerations of some new problems. So I just want to throw that caveat first to temper expectations. So first, what do I mean by personalized pricing algorithms? Uh, I'm really referring to a broad class of algorithms that set price on a person-by-person -person basis. So really, you can think of it as a scaled, automated, data-driven version of haggling. Um, you know, so the examples are airlines are currently investigating ways to price ancillary services, such as how much legroom you get, number of checked bags, in-flight meals, and such. Um, and uh, another example that was on the news a few years ago was how Home, Depot's and Home Depot and Staples both changed the prices they offered on their storefront based on the user zip code, uh, primarily based on their distance to a brick and mortar store. So the more difficult it was to pursue an outside option, the higher the price that would be set. And, you know, the one that's kind of most relevant to the sort of the formalizations that we're going to be talking about today is, you know, websites like Orbitz, Expedia, Hotels.com, and Priceline. Um, you know, they'll charge different prices based on your browsing history, your OS, your age, your income, any other features they have. And, you know, my favorite little anecdote about this is that there was a consistent trend that they saw in like 2012 where um, if you were browsing these sites with a Mac rather than a PC, you'd see higher prices. And that just makes so, so much sense that this is, you know, probably one of the best proxies for level of disposable income is if you're using a Mac. Right. So the last thing that I want to say before I start talking about the problem setup is that um, the intent of this project is not to take any stance on whether or not personalized pricing algorithms are good or not. Um, the question of whether or not they're beneficial to society is, I think, a nuanced one. I, th I think it does have its pros and it does have its cons. Um, so, for example, uh, if I'm looking back to like Halvarian's, one of Halvarian's seminal papers in 1985, where he basically argues about how price discrimination can increase social welfare overall. 
Basic idea is that if an individual values a good at $400, society should be willing to allocate up to 400, like the economy and society and all the companies should be willing to allocate up to $400 worth of its resources to create that product. If you have to charge the same price for everyone, it could be that you are only allowed to charge $300 for that product. And as a result, you could have a company willing to manufacture it for $350 and an individual willing to pay $400 for it, but that trade doesn't happen because we can't do price discrimination. So in a lot of ways, being able to sort of target every individual's valuation could lead to more societally beneficial, efficient resource allocation. But you know, on the other hand, I think this is the one that kind of jumps to the front of mind first. There are lots of fairness issues um, and equity issues in the deployment of these algorithms. Different populations are affected differently and we see examples of that sort of all the time. We see zip codes used as proxies for race. We see, you know, Apple credit cards offering very different offers based pretty much on gender, uh, even though gender is not directly observed. There are fairness issues. Um, but there also are social benefits. So it's a really nuanced question about whether or not these algorithms are overall beneficial to society in what ways and in what ways they're negative. I don't really intend to take a stance on that at all. I do just want to say independent of that, most of the work thus far has been focused on the seller's perspective. So, you know, these problems ask questions like given the available data, how do we set prices to extract the maximum willingness to pay to maximize revenue from consumers? So here we refers to the seller. And in contrast, the work I want to talk about today, our work really focuses on the consumer. So given the personalized pricing algorithm as exogenously fixed, how do we make our purchasing decisions? In this case, we refers to the consumer. So, you know, what should the consumer do? Um, with that, uh, go ahead and start. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the problem setup. Um, we consider a discrete time finite horizon setting. So what we look at is we are looking at um, time indices are just going to be. Uh, oh nope. Okay, so I'm not going to try to <laughs> do the pointer. All right, time indices are blackboard T goes from zero to capital T. Uh, the consumer is considering the purchase of a single indivisible good and at each time step the consumer learns about her valuation while simultaneously revealing information to the seller and just to sort of ease how make it easier to talk about I'm going to use she her pronouns for the consumer and he him pronouns for the seller. Great. So the when I take the seller's perspective. Uh, at each time step, we view his information as the sigma algebra f of t. So just as an example, if he makes observations of some random variable y t of s, then his available information at time t is a sigma algebra generated by y0 to y t um, up to that time. And because the uh, available information grows and the seller knows more and more across time, the sequence of sigma algebras forms a filtration. Um, and at each time step with this available information, he must offer a price to the consumer. So the way we model this is that the pricing strategy is a random variable. PT is this random variable that is constrained to be FT measurable. So, you know, PT evaluated at omega is the realized price. Um, and each price P of T has to be something that the seller can decide based on his available information. That's the constraint that's FTS measurable. Um, so in an example, if that sigma algebra is just generated by some observations, then the price has to be a function of the observations. So these random variables really at their core are contingency plans. They're sort of mappings of what to do in different situations. So when you know, Y0 through YT realize a certain value, then what do I set the price to? So they're contingency plans. They're not just numbers. And the idea is that the seller credibly pre-commits to his pricing strategies to these contingency plans, to these functions at the beginning of the interaction. So even before the consumer makes her first decision, um, you know, the, the seller has already announced P0 through P capital T. Like all these functions are known, so the consumer really knows sort of the arc of where prices will go um, in a distributional sense. And that is one of the strongest assumptions that we make throughout this work, and I'll talk a little bit more about relaxing this at the end. Right. So that's sort of the setup. This is how the seller looks at it. He takes his available information and has to set prices based on the information available to him at each point in time. And this is how we formalize it. 
Um, from the consumer's perspective, like I said, the seller has credibly pre-committed to these pricing strategies PFT, so she knows this in advance. <laughs> Her information at time T is just a sigma algebra F of T, no superscript S anymore. Again, the sequence forms a filtration because she's her information state is growing. And uh, also the prices are announced to her at time T, so P of T is going to be measurable with respect to F of T. Um, so at each time T, she has three possible choices. One, she can purchase the good immediately. She'll receive a payoff pi of T, and then the game will end. No future interactions. Single indivisible good purchased. The second action she can take is she can reject the good immediately. She'll receive a payoff of zero, and the game will end also. And the third option she can take is that she'll continue learning, and the game's just going to keep going. So those are three actions. Purchase, reject, continue. Um, and just to sort of outline to sort of try and make this a little bit more clear, I want to go through this sort of example that we actually analyze in the numerical results section. So the, let's just go through an example that kind of fits the framework we just mentioned. I just want to emphasize that this is not like the only case we're considering, but just an example to sort of illustrate what I mean by a lot of the stuff I said in the previous two slides. So in this case, uh, we suppose the consumer's true valuation is V. Uh, she doesn't know this true valuation, um, but at each time step T, she learns this V of T, which is her true valuation plus a bunch of noise. And this noise is a bunch of zero mean Gaussian random variables added to it. They're independent, which I think I forgot to put on the slide, but they're independent. And at each time step, she sees a, a more accurate observation of V because she's sort of just peeling away layers of the onion and observing something with less, fewer epsilon terms added. So another way to phrase this is that her posterior at time t of her true valuation is distributed according to a Gaussian random variable centered at v of t with a variance that shrinks with time. So as little t increases, the variance goes down and down, and that's really how her belief of her true valuation goes. This is how she learns more across each time step. Um, so she's offered a price, p of t of omega, <clears throat> and her realized payoff will be V minus P of T. So, you know, uh, V is this unknown quantity, uh, P of T is this random variable. So the idea is just that these, um, this is her realized payoff, but she doesn't know in advance whether or not that'll be the case. So given her available information, her realized payoff will be distributed according to this. So V minus P of T is a Gaussian random variable with mean V of T minus P of T and this uh, variance. And that's what's gonna be important on the next slide. So her realized payoff is gonna be this quantity with this distribution, and then we're gonna look at her expected utility from it. So uh, we're gonna assume she has this constant absolute risk aversion utility function that's commonly used in the literature. Um, basically, it just exponentiates sort of the payoff so that you uh, get the sort of risk aversion factor and you lose the, the linearity of a risk neutral utility function. So, if this is the uh, utility function she has, then her payoff from a purchase at time t is the expected value of u of x of t, where x of t is as I described in the previous slide. It's got a mean of v of t minus p of t and it has a variance here. And if I plug that into the constant absolute risk aversion uh, utility function, I get this equation here, which is 1 minus this exponential, some term that just depends on the mean, and some term that just depends on the variance. So there's just like a few things to kind of think about to sort of observe here uh, to make sure we're on the same page about this model. The first is that if we, first off, is that V of T, this process, is actually a martingale. In expectation, it stays the same. Like, at time T, you know V of T, and you expect V of T plus one, in expectation, should actually equal V of T. There's, you know, the epsilon turns are zero mean, and it forms a martingale. So in expectation, the, the mean payoff should not change. However, even holding the mean payoff constant, so not changing V of T here, we can see that as time goes forward, our payoff increases here. And that's just the risk aversion. So as time goes on, um, even holding our valuation, expected valuation constant, because the variance goes down, and because we're running it through a risk averse utility function, we see that the payoff is actually increasing across time, holding everything equal. Um, just because of the risk aversion. And the second thing to note is that even though the consumer doesn't know her true valuation at time t, she can calculate pi of t. So pi of t is really her expected utility from purchasing at time t, accounting for all the uncertainty about her valuation. So even though she doesn't know her true valuation, she's able to calculate pi of t, and that's really what's essential here. It's really her uh, 
accounting for her uncertainty and her risk aversion in her utility function and calculating um, you know, the expected utility which she uses to make her decisions. Cool, so that's an example model. And uh, with that, what we can do with this formulation is we can actually phrase it as an optimal stopping time problem. And it's pretty straightforward how we do that. We just combine the purchase and reject action into a single action, which is the exit action. So this action has a payoff, which is the maximum. Uh, it's, you know, pi of t or zero. So it's the max of those two terms. Um, and the way you can interpret this is that the consumer, instead of deciding whether or not to purchase, reject, or continue, you can think of it as the consumer deciding when, whether to exit or not. And when she does choose to exit, she just picks optimally between purchase and reject. So given that she's exiting at time t, if pi of t is greater than zero, she purchases. If zero is greater than pi of t, she rejects. So um, now, rather than having three choices, you can really view it as just having two. Do I stop, do I exit or do I continue? <clears throat> and at that point, it should be pretty clear that we can phrase this as an optimal stopping time problem. So formally, a stopping time is just a t-valued random element such that, you know, tau equals t is ft measurable. The basic idea is it's just a random element that takes on values between zero and capital T in our time indices with the constraint that tau equals t has to be a quantity that the consumer can decide with her available information. So you can interpret tau as this random element which denotes when she chooses to exit. And so at time t, her available information is f of t, and she has to be able to know if the set, uh, if she's in the set of universes such that tau equals t. So to make the decision on whether or not to exit at time t, it has to be something that can be decided with only access to the information in f of t here. So stopping time is just that sort of element, and we're going to let script t denote the set of stopping times. The basic idea is that the consumer is trying to find a stopping time tau star, such that the expected value of h of tau star, so h is her value process, h of tau star is the value process stopped according to the rule of tau star, and that should equal the supremum across all stopping times of her expected payoffs of the stopped process. So we need, want to find a tau star that supremizes her payoff. <clears throat> um, but, you know, what originally started was a consumer interacting with personalized pricing algorithms and, you know, through some of our modeling assumptions and then this reduction covered on this slide, we're able to phrase it as a problem of finding an optimal stopping time. Um, so uh, I don't have time in this talk to really go into too many details about it, but you can see the paper for more details about uh, of this, you can solve the optimal stopping time problem using the Snell envelope and dynamic programming. And throughout the paper, we talk a lot about sort of the connections with mathematical finance. It's kind of interesting that the optimal stopping time literature is most developed in uh, the finance community because it relates to the optimal exercising of an American option, which is like a type of contingent claim or um, stock option that frequently exists. It's sort of a exercise at will option. So this problem is heavily studied in finance and there's a lot of really interesting results there and we draw some of those connections. And then we also leverage some of the stuff in computational finance to provide computational methods for approximating the optimal stopping time. So we talk about in the paper how to do this algorithm and the sort of heuristics that were common in the uh, computational finance literature and sort of how this applies to our setting and how we can implement it. Um, the one sort of key thing that um, I do want to mention a little bit about some of the relaxations made is that in practice, um, it might not be, even though the optimal stopping time problem is more or less solved in theory, at least in sort of the basic case we consider, um, in practice, it's, there's a lot of things that make it difficult. So representing infinite dimensional random variables, the conditional expectation operator, which is a projection in an infinite dimensional space, and all these different things uh, make it difficult to represent compute, and it also might just cause unrealistic assumptions on the information the consumer has access to. So the consumer has to know the functions P of T in advance, as we talked about in a few, a few slides ago, and has to know the probability distributions of everything. So uh, in this section, we talk a little bit about relaxing it such that the consumer doesn't need to know P of T and the probability distributions, but instead just has access to observations of several sample paths. So H of zero to H of T, we see, you know, a bunch of realizations of this. Um, and just from that, we kind of can build these sort of data-driven methods for approximating the optimal stopping time. And that's covered in detail in the paper. Um, I don't really have much time to go over it in this talk, so I've decided to sort of cut it out and refer everyone to the archive paper, which um, 
is linked to on our uh, one pager on the fork website. So it's on archive. Um, yeah. Okay, so I do want to go over sort of some of the computational results so you can kind of see the flavor of things that happen um, and also to sort of get a more concrete feel of the model we considered. So here, if we look at the top plot, we have this green line here, which represents the consumer's understanding of her own valuation. So at time zero, it's this green line which indicates her expected value of the valuation and then some green bars that indicate her uncertainty about it. As time goes on, this valuation process kind of drifts a little bit, but we also see that sort of the uncertainty uh, bars kind of narrow until the final time step t equals 25. You can see that she knows her valuation exactly. There's no uncertainty whatsoever. So as she learns about her own valuation across time, you can see that visualization here in the green bar. Simultaneously, the seller is trying to learn about the consumer, and as time goes on, he makes more and more observations about her preferences. So that's represented with the blue uh, blue line and the blue bars. So starts out with uh, you know some prior on the consumer's valuation, and then he makes observations iteratively, and then we kind of see that the uncertainty narrows to the sort of steady state thing. And you know we had we talked about the model a few slides ago. It's a Gaussian model, so the method the seller uses in this example is the Kalman filter. So it reaches the sort of steady state covariance matrix, which is what we see in the bars kind of after around like uh, time step 11 or so. We see kind of the uncertainty reaches its steady state uncertainty. Where in contrast, the consumer knows her valuation exactly by the end of the whole thing. Um, and, you know, based on that, the seller sets an offered price, which is sort of the red line here. And the way we set the pricing strategy, there are more details in the archive paper, but the basic idea is that the seller assumes the consumer is myopic and then sets a price to maximize his expected revenue. So the probability that the price is less than the valuation times the price. He, he tries to maximize that uh, where the probabilities are calculated according to his posterior. So he has a sort of myopic pricing scheme to set this red line. And if we put all that together, we can see this value process, this H of T we're talking about uh, in the second graph below. So, you know, at the beginning, if you look at the top graph, the green line is way below the red line. So the prices are too high. There's not going to be any benefit. So uh, the consumer is not going to purchase the good. The payoff is going to be zero, the same payoff from rejection. Then we get to time step 13, the price kind of dips below the green line and it's enough to overcome the risk aversion to the point where the payoff from a purchase at time 13 is positive. So if you had a myopic uh, consumer that was just purchasing whenever her utility was positive, she would exit at that point and get uh, a positive payoff. In contrast, the algorithmic stopping method would actually sort of look at how the prices would evolve in the future, look at um, her current understanding of her own valuation and her risk aversion and kind of account for all that and decide whether or not it made sense to wait, to see if her payoff increases in the future, to wait to see if the price decreases. So you can see that this algorithmic stopping method actually stops uh, at time 19. So it waits a little bit longer and gets a much higher payoff as a result. So this is kind of one of the trajectories you can kind of imagine. Um, so hopefully this gives a sense of what's happening. The myopic purchase basically exits whenever utility is positive, but this algorithmic stopping chooses to sort of gamble and hope, uh, gamble when it's smart to and try to get higher payoffs. Um, the consequence is that sometimes the myopic, per, uh, the myopic strategy will receive positive payoff, whereas the algorithmic stopping one will receive zero payoff because it was a gamble that didn't pay off. They waited and then the payoffs weren't good. But in expectation, this is done in a kind of smart way so that you know, the expected payoff increases across sample paths. And we can kind of see that in this histogram. So this plot here plots the difference in payoff for a bunch of different sample paths um, based on whether or not a myopic stopping strategy is used or um, the algorithmic stopping method uh, we looked at is. So, uh, what we can see here is there's this very tall bar around zero, which means that about 40% of the time, uh, both receive the same payoff. They either both reject the good or they both exit at the same time, and there's not really any difference. So 40% of the time, the myopic strategy and the algorithmic stopping strategy more or less get the same payoff. On the left, we see a few cases where the algorithmic stopping time kind of waits a little bit longer and actually gets a lower payoff as a result. 
On the right-hand side of zero, we see all the cases where using the algorithmic stopping uh, strategy and kind of being a little bit more patient can actually increase the payoff. And you can see that this is an increase in expectation because this red line here is the expected value. We actually see, you know, this bias towards the right side where the algorithmic stopping method is better in expectation. The kind of key important takeaway from this is that we don't actually get, um, you know, improved performance on every sample path. We only really get it on average. Great. So I talked about how I would cover some of this is, you know, this is preliminary work and there are a lot of shortcomings here that we'd love to talk about and address in future work. Um, please message me or email me in some capacity. If you have any thoughts or comments about any of these bullet points, I'm happy to chat about it. I think it's, you know, a really cool direction that I'm really excited to pursue. So uh, the first one is, uh, you know, we relaxed the assumption about knowledge of PFT and the probability distributions to the point where the consumer only had access to sample paths. But is that reasonable? Is that assuming too much information for the consumer? Um, more generally, have we faithfully represented how much information the consumer has? So we're really looking at real world applications and, you know, data sets that we can kind of apply some of these methods to make sure that some of these assumptions are realistic. Um, the other question is, can and would a seller credibly pre-commit? So there are quite a few works in the game theory literature that kind of argue that this is a rational strategy and that the seller, if they can credibly pre-commit, should because it can kind of set the stage for what equilibrium and what settings or what game is played. But, you know, is it reasonable in real world applications? And that's kind of an open problem. And one of the future directions we're looking at is rather than taking the pricing strategies as exogenously fixed, we're looking at whether or not um, we can uh, look at it as a Stackelberg game formulation where the pricing strategies have to be decided to maximize the seller's revenue subject to the consumer reacting with an optimal stopping time. So there's an optimal stopping time uh, kind of thing entering as a constraint. Um, so the next problem is, does this model capture context? Uh, which, you know, it's not, there are a lot of abstractions here about like filtrations and stuff, which, you know, in the abstract will totally capture things like all the feature vectors and all this sort of learning. But, you know, when you actually get to the computational side and the implementation, does it successfully capture all these things? That's something that hopefully when we kind of get closer to some data, you know, real data experiments, whether, we'll see whether or not this holds. The last one is, can we interpret the impact of parameters? And so really, I think a lot of these types of problems had been studied in the game theory literature uh, before. So games of asymmetric information, you can think of things like the Rubenstein stall bargaining models. Um, but a lot of times those have very simplified models. Like there's two possible valuations, high or low. You make observations of some correlated Bernoulli random variable and you take it across two time steps, say. And these are the types of games where all these parameters have these sort of nice interpretations. In contrast, what we focused on was a lot of the sort of computational methods that can handle sort of a wide range of different, you know, randomized strategies and all these sorts of things. Uh, we're just kind of looking at computational methods. And I think something that'd be kind of interesting is to see the impact of parameters if we kind of, you know, play with our model a little bit more and kind of hone it down to a few key parameters, but also if, you know, it reduces to and can recover some of these classical results in the game theory literature, which we haven't had a chance to look into yet, but, you know, we're really hoping to do soon. So uh, I'm a little bit over time, so I just want to wrap up real quick. So in this talk, we looked at an algorithm for a consumer to maximize their expected utility in a setting where she learns under surveillance. The idea is she's just trying to collect more data while some observer is watching this process and potentially using that information to learn more. So that's sort of the graphic we have at the bottom, this general problem of learning under surveillance. We have a learner making decisions in front of an observer and receiving some private samples while the observer is kind of learning from the observations he's making. Uh, we, we were able to, by fixing the seller strategy, we were able to put this in an optimal stopping time framework and provided some computational methods for the consumer's decision making. So, you know, this is really only applicable in the settings where we view the seller as sort of pre-committing to the strategy in a credible way that, you know, is known to the consumer in some way. And uh, finally, we really, you know, this is, we feel like this is one of the first results that look at things from the consumer's perspective. And it's kind of a problem we hadn't seen too much work on before. So we hope that this sets the stage for some interesting future questions and algorithms that take the side of the consumer. Okay, so I'm over time. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please, uh, I guess this is probably on YouTube. Yeah, please have a good one. Thank you for listening. Here's some of my contact info. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much for your time.